Now, the title of the service is the same title as it was last week, I Need Christ. And we're going to continue to look at Psalms 90. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalms 90, we're going to continue reading. Now, the title of the sermon is I Need Christ. And last week I talked about the importance of that. That was a great title, but it is a way of, of the Christian life that we, we need Christ, not just in salvation alone, but all the days of our life. We need Christ in regeneration. We need Christ in justification. We need Christ most definitely in sanctification. And we most certainly will need Christ when we see the Lord face to face in glorification. Amen. Now, the reason why we're looking at Psalms 90, I talked about the heaviness of of that situation with Moses and the Israelites. And I believe that the Lord will do something special as we focus on the death and the judgment that they had to, to walk through as we, we come into Advent time of the year, as we focus on the birth of Christ. And as we really look at death, God is able to really show us the brightness of his light through the birth of Christ. Now, I need Christ. Another favorite saying of mine, which is what Brother Paul coins, he says he is the foolish thing that God chose. Or he says that God chose the foolish things, which I believe that is definitely me. I am foolish. I say foolish things. And without the Lord's grace and mercy, I do not stand a chance. Amen. Now, when we look at Psalms 90, the context of that was the Israelites were afraid to go into the promised land. Now, because they're afraid to go into the promised land, they're more afraid of the giants than God. God placed that whole generation under judgment for 40 years. And then we would see, if you were to read the book of Numbers, you'd see that this whole generation would die out in the wilderness. Now, Psalms 90 is the oldest psalm which we talked about. Moses penned it probably at the end of the journey in the wilderness after living through this judgment that God placed upon the Israelites so the Israelites would wander for 40 years in the wilderness and then a whole generation would die. And then we would see in the gospel that Christ is the perfect Israelite. And symbolically, Christ goes into the wilderness, the desert, for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. Highlighting when we read Psalms 90, the importance of Christ in the gospel. Because if you read Psalms 90 without... The gospel as your frame of reference, there's not a whole lot of hope in it. Now, I believe whenever we read the scriptures that we should always be thinking of the gospel. So let me go ahead and read Psalms 90, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read through 6, just to recap what we went over last week, and then I'll start in verse 7, and we'll start to dig into the scripture a little more. Psalms 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born... Or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You turn people back to dust saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new. But by evening, it is dry and withered. Verse 7. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. That's a fun word to say, indignation. Now, some of you guys know I get peanut butter mouth sometimes, so I had to phonetically put that down in my notes so it came out just right. God chose the foolish things of the world. Somebody thinks I'm foolish. Who laughed? I'm just kidding. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. Now, this is a serious situation for the Israelites. Uh, but this is the situation that all sinners are born into. We are consumed by your anger. See, this is a, a terrible place to be at. Now, we talked about the Hebrew word for, for dust last week. And dust means the ka. And it means also dust, but crushed. And we know that we are consumed by your anger, but this is the good news of the gospel. Because Christ bore our penalty in himself on the cross. See, Christ was the ka. Christ was crushed for our inequities. See, Christ died for a reason, for a purpose. 
When I first became a Christian, people would always tell me, Jesus loves you. And that sounds great. And they would say it like this, Jesus loves you because he died for you. I'm like, okay, so Jesus loves me because he died for me. And I'd always be like, but, but couldn't he just have said he loves me? Why did he have to die for me? Like, I didn't understand, like, the rich theology in just somebody saying that. I didn't understand the propitiation of sin. Fun word, right? I didn't understand that he was a substitutionary atonement. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the doctrine of justification. And you don't have to when God saves you. I just knew that he loved me and he died for me. But I didn't understand why he died for me. But as God would begin to sanctify me and grow me in my faith, I'd start to see the richness of why he actually died for me, the mechanism in his death, the purpose that he was fulfilling something on my behalf. See, Christ drank the cup of eternal wrath for you, for me. And that, should, that should break us. That God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to drink the cup of eternal wrath. Whew. That's a big deal. Now, some of you are like, here you go again, Brian. You always talk about wrath. <laughs> I know, somebody has to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love God's love. And we should always talk of God's love. But to really understand the significance of God's love, we must first understand his wrath. We must understand what he saved us from. I must understand what I deserve by nature, I am a child of wrath. I deserve wrath. But then God steps into my story and gives me something other than what I deserve, which was wrath. And then he gives me grace and he gives me mercy. He gives me life and he takes a dead thing and he brings life into him. And then he resurrects him and then he leads him down a new way. That's the gospel. Woo! <laughs> Amen. It gets me, it gets me excited. Because outside of the gospel, there is no life. Now, as Moses is writing this, the only thing that will save Moses is the gospel. But he doesn't know the gospel. He knows God and he knows he needs his grace and mercy, but he hasn't seen the glory of God in the face of Christ as we have in here today. Verse 8. You have, you have set our inequities before you, our secret sins in the light of of your presence. Moses is realizing something. As this judgment is, is on them, he's realizing like there's no way of getting out of this situation. And everything they've done is, is in the light of God. Like they don't, they're not going to get away with, with anything. There's no escaping this situation. But that's the way it is with everybody. See, we are all born under this judgment. See, there is no escaping the judgment that we deserve on our own. Yet again, the good news of the gospel. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.13, he says, everything is laid bare before God to whom we will have to give an account. But thank God that God counts Christ as you. See, we will give an account for the deeds done in the body. But the deeds that save us are the deeds Christ did, born under the law to uphold the law, to redeem those born under the law. See, Christ lived the life that we should live but can't, died the death that we should die but don't. And then God does something in the midst of all this. He resurrects us from the curse that we are born into, and that is when we become a new creation, born again. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. And let me refresh some of your memories. We talked about last week. Like Moses is living a life of death. Every day, people die all around him because of this judgment God placed on them. And he's feeling it. I mean, for 40 years, like we're not getting out of this. An entire generation, 1.2 million people have to pass away before the next generation can enter into the promised land. That weightiness, that heaviness Moses has. He says, all our days pass away under your wrath. 
There's that word again. We finish our years with a moan. He's like, I mean, that's, that's all we have. Just, this, this, uh, just an exhaustion from living this life under God's judgment. This was the whole generation in the wilderness. But this is also the generations of people who have been born and never received the gift of Christ. The natural man, apart from the supernatural work of God in that person's life, if he never repents of his sins and believes in Christ as the way, the truth, the life, as the only way to be right with God, he will finish his years with a moan. That is the natural life. There is no crown. There is no victory. See, a life apart from Christ feels like that. Now, if you're in here and God saved you a little bit further along the way, some of us might have grown up in the church, but those of us who didn't grow up in the church and remember being a child of wrath, remember being an enemy of God, I remember what it was like that to... When I heard the cross, the cross was foolish to those who are perishing. I remembered the angst and the anxiety and the, just, the, just the cringiness I had when I heard people share of the gospel. I remember my flesh being an enemy to God. I remember being hostile to God, wanting nothing to do with God. I remember being more worried about the giants in this life than being afraid of God. I was, I'm so grateful and thankful that I was not an Israelite, born then. As I talked about last week, there are a handful of us in here, Caleb's and Joshua's and Moses, but not me. I would have been just a dirty, filthy Israelite, afraid of giants, not trusting God, dying in the wilderness. I have my own wilderness. I was lost in my chemical addiction, squandered everything. And if God didn't step into my life at just the right time, I would have died under judgment. See, and I know that. That is why I'm so grateful and thankful for the gift of life that God has given me and us in the gospel. Amen? Verse 10. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures the struggle Yet the, the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So the verse above that, he says that we finish our years with a moan, and now, now Moses is saying, maybe we'll live for some time if our strength endures this judgment. I mean, this heaviness that we're, we're all walking in. I mean, just death all day long. I mean, this is, this is a, a struggle. And then, he says that yet the best of those days, they finish their, their, their life with a moan and maybe they'll live to 70 or 80 years. But he says, he says, but the best of the days are but trouble and sorrow. The best of them are but trouble and sorrow. We can learn a lot from this poem Moses is writing as he's reflecting on his experience of living under God's judgment. See, a life apart from God's grace and mercy in Christ has no value. The most value an unregenerate lost child of Adam, the most value they can bring to the table, well, Moses says right here, he says, the best of them are just trouble and sorrow. (laughs) See, when I show up to the judgment seat of God, I bring trouble and sorrow. (laughs) I don't show up with anything. I don't add anything to the equation. I don't make the relationship better. I need God and I need all of God and I need God to change me. I need him to give me a new heart. I need him to renew my mind. I need a new nature. I need a new spirit. I need a new family. I need a new inheritance. I need a new way. Why do I need a new way? Man, I, I gleam. I gleam from the Israelites. So I'm learning from them, as I hope all of us in here this morning are. See, the life outside of Christ, the best of it is, is trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. Now, some of us remember what King Solomon said, richest man in the world, wisest man in the world. 
He could have anything he wanted. And he did. But yet it never satisfied him. And he went out to discover what the meaning of life was. And he discovered it was utterly meaningless. <laughs> like that's the wisest man discovered that, you know, we finish our life with a moan and trouble and sorrow, you know, is the best of this life that we have apart from the grace and mercy of God. Because he says that it's all utterly meaningless except the fear of the Lord and the keeping of his commands. The wisest man of the day discovered that the only thing that had any value was to fear God and to try to follow his ways. Verse 11. If only we knew the power of your anger. I think they're, they're kind of experiencing it, but they're not fully experiencing it. I, I think that's it's amazing what Moses says right here. He says, if only we knew the power of your anger. He's saying like, if, like there, he's realizing, Moses is realizing there's actually more that God could have done to them. Like in the midst of this judgment, Moses is realizing there's yet grace and mercy for them. And that he can't even wrap his mind around how much more could this anger be. See, Moses is starting to have an eternal focus here. Now, these are just theological thoughts. It's not saying that in the text. But I think we could come to that conclusion pretty reasonably. If only we knew the power of your anger. See, when we become aware of God's power and anger, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, see that fear, as we'll talk about in the next uh, couple weeks, that fear of the Lord drives us to Christ. The fear of God's judgment for our natural lives is what actually drives us to receive the love of God in Christ then our fear turns to reverence for the way he loves us. I was first afraid, but now I have reverence because I see that he has his great love for me. That is the gospel. He says, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. See, Moses is saying, you got us. <laughs> you got us. You deserve justice, God. That's what he's saying there. He's like, God, you deserve justice. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. You deserve justice and you deserve us to be afraid of you. That's the conclusion of this journey through the wilderness. Moses is seeing that. He recognizes, just as the thief did on the cross, he saw that he was guilty and Christ was innocent. He recognized that. And the thief, by God's grace and mercy, when he opened his eyes to his guilt, he looked at the other thief on the cross who was mocking Christ and he said, you fool. He didn't say that, but this is kind of what he said. He said, don't you see that we're guilty, but this man is innocent? Like we're getting what our deeds deserve, but he's innocent. See, Moses is seeing that. He's realizing like, this is a, this is a bad situation we're in, but guess what? We're guilty. We're guilty. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Now, this is when the gospel walks in the room, though. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the good news. See, when you understand that, that God is due justice, then you're that much more broken for the cross of Christ. See, the cross of Christ is where God's justice and his love meet. It's the crossroads. It's the intersection. See, God is able to have full justice upon our lives and yet redeem us from our lives see if somebody killed a loved one in your family and they forgave them or the judge forgave them and said go ahead and live about your life but they never did a time in jail we would think that that judge was unjust like they killed a loved one in your family and they go before the judge and the judge a natural judge not a supernatural judge not a loving just god but just a natural man and the man looked at him and said, he heard his story. He heard his plea. And he's like, you know what? I'll give you grace and mercy. I forgive you. He goes, try not to do that again. Go live a good life. Now, the family members in the courtroom would be like, that's not fair. That's not right. We want justice. So how does a, a perfect, holy, just, loving God maintain all his attributes in forgiving and setting free sinners? Christ. See, Christ steps in and 
takes our sentence for us. He receives our penalty, our penalty for us. See, another man takes our place. That is the good news of the gospel. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. When we understand God's wrath, we can be that much more grateful for his, his forgiveness. We can be that much more grateful for his love. When you realize that you don't deserve to be forgiven, when you don't deserve salvation, but yet somehow, some way, God gives you grace and mercy. And then you're unworthy to be saved, but yet somehow, some way, God says you're worthy. And he calls us all out of darkness. He calls us all out of the grave. He, he calls us all out of those places where we were. He calls his own sheep out by name. And we come to him in droves because, because he saved us, because we realize what we deserve. And we're so grateful that we don't get it. And we see the love of God in the face of Christ on the cross. And then this is where we're going to end today. And this is what Moses says in verse, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I think that's a, a good verse for us to chew on when we're looking at the wrath of God and the love of God and the light that God has given us and what the Israelites were doing when they're wandering through the wilderness under this judgment. And then Moses says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Moses is coming to a conclusion here that, that these days matter, even if they, they end in a moan. Let us pray.